As the sun went down and the evening chill came on, we made preparation for bed. We stirred up the hard leather letter sacks and the knotty canvas bags of printed matter, knotty and uneven because of projecting ends and corners of magazines, boxes, and books. We stirred them up and redisposed them in such a way as to make our bed as level as possible. And we did improve it, too, though after all our work, it had an upheaved and billowy look about it, like a little piece of a stormy sea. Next we hunted up our boots from the odd nooks among the mailbags where they'd settled and put them on. Then we got down our coats, vests, pantaloons, and heavy woolen shirts from the arm loops where they'd all been swinging all day and clothed ourselves in them. For there being no ladies either at the station or in the coach and the weather being hot, we had looked to our comfort by stripping to our underclothing at nine o'clock in the morning. All things being now ready, we stowed the uneasy dictionary where it would lie as quiet as possible and placed the water canteens and pistols where we could find them in the dark. Then we smoked a final pipe and swapped our final yard, after which we put the pipes, tobacco, and bag of coins in snug holes and caves among the mail bags, and then fastened down the coach curtains all around and made the place as dark as the inside of a cow as the conductor phrased it in his picturesque way. It was certainly as dark as any place could be. Nothing was even dimly visible in it. And finally we rolled ourselves up like silkworms, each person in his own blanket, and sank peacefully to sleep. Whenever the stage stopped to change horses, we would wake up and try to recollect where we were and succeed. And in a minute or two the stage would be off again, and we likewise. We began to get into country now, threaded here and there with little streams. These had high, steep banks on each side, and every time we flew down one bank and scrambled up the other, our party inside got mixed somewhat. First would be all down in a pile at the forward end of the stage, nearly in a sitting posture, and in a second we would shoot to the other end and stand on our heads. We would sprawl and kick too, and ward off ends and corners of mail bags came lumbering over us and about us, and as the dust rose from the tumult, we would all sneeze in chorus, and a majority of us would grumble and probably say some hasty thing like, take your elbow out of my ribs, can't you quit crowding? Every time we avalanched from one end of the stage to the other, the unabridged dictionary would come too, and every time it came it damaged somebody. One trip it barked the secretary's elbow, the next trip it hurt me in the stomach, and the third it tilted Bemis's nose up till he could look down his own nostril. The pistols and coins soon settled to the bottom, but the pipes, pipe stems, tobacco, and canteens clattered and floundered after the dictionary every time it made an assault on us, and aided and abetted the book by spilling tobacco in our eyes and water down our back. Still, all things considered, it was a very comfortable night. It wore gradually away, and when at last a cold gray light was visible through the puckers and chinks in the curtains, we yawned and stretched with satisfaction, shed our cocoons, and felt that we had slept as much as was necessary. By and by, as the sun rose up and warmed the world, we pulled off our clothes and got ready for breakfast. We were just pleasantly in time for five minutes afterwards. The driver sent the weird music of his bugle winding over the grassy solitudes, and presently we detected a low hut or two in the distance. Then the rattling of the coach, the clatter of our horses' hoofs, and the driver's crisp command awoke to a louder, stronger emphasis, and we went sweeping down on the station at our smartest speed. It was fascinating, that old overland stage coaching. We jumped out in undress uniform. The driver tossed his gathered reins out on the ground, gaped and stretched and complacently drew off his heavy buckskin gloves with great deliberation and insufferable dignity, taking not the slightest notice of a dozen solicitous inquiries after his health and humbly facetious and flattering accostings and obsequious tenders of service from five or six hairy and half-civilized station keepers and hostlers who were nimbly unhitching our steeds and bringing the fresh team out of the stables, for in the eyes of the stage driver of that day, 
station keepers and hostlers were a sort of good enough low creatures useful in their place and helping to make up a world but not the kinds of things which a person of distinction could afford to concern himself with while on the contrary in the eyes of the station keeper and the hostler the stage driver was a hero a great and shining dignitary the world's favorite son the envy of the people the observed of the nations when they spoke to him they received his insolent silence meekly and as a being a natural and proper conduct of so great a man when he opened his lips they all hung on his words with admiration he never honored a particular individual with a remark, but addressed it with broad generality to the horses, the stables, the surrounding country, and the human underlings. When he discharged the facetious, insulting personality at a hostler, the hostler was happy for the day when he uttered his one jest, old as the hills, coarse, profane, witless, and inflicted on the same audience in the same language every time his coach drove up there, the varlets roared and slapped their thighs and swore it was the best thing they'd ever heard all their lives. And how they would fly around when he wanted a basin of water, a gourd of the same, or a light for his pipe. For they would constantly insult a passenger if he so far forgot themselves to crave a favor at their hands. They could do that sort of insolence as well as the driver they copied it from, for let it be borne in mind the overland driver had but little less contempt for his passengers than he had for his hostlers. The hostlers and station keepers treated the really powerful conductor of the coach merely with the best of what was their idea of civility, but the driver was the only being they bowed down to and worshipped. How admiringly they would gaze up at him in his high seat as he gloved himself with lingering deliberation, while some happy hostler held a bunch of reins aloft and waited patiently for him to take it, and how they would bombard him with glorifying ejaculations as he cracked his long whip and went careering away. The station buildings were long, low huts made of sun-dried and mud-colored bricks, laid up without mortar, adobes, the Spaniards call these bricks, and Americans shorten them to dobies. The roofs, which had no slant to them worth speaking of, were thatched, and then sodded or covered with a thick layer of earth, and from this sprung a pretty rank growth of weeds and grass. It was the first time we had ever seen a man's front yard on top of his house. The building consisted of barns, stable room for twelve or fifteen horses, and a hut for an eating room for passengers. This latter had bunks in it for the station keeper and a hostler or two. You could rest your elbows on its eaves, and you had to bend in order to get in at the door. In place of a window there was a square hole about large enough for a man to crawl through, but this had no glass in it. There was no flooring, but the ground was hard packed. There was no stove, but the fireplace served all needful purposes. There were no shelves, no cupboards, no closets. In a corner stood an open sack of flour, and nestling against its base was a couple of black and venerable tin coffee pots a tin teapot, a little bag of salt, and a side of bacon. By the door of the station keeper's den outside was a tin wash basin on the ground. Near it was a pail of water and a piece of yellow bar soap. And from the eaves hung a hoary blue woolen shirt, significantly. But this latter was the station keeper's private towel, and only two persons in all the party might venture to use it, the stage driver and the conductor. The latter would not, from a sense of decency, the former would not, because did not choose to encourage the advances of a station keeper. We had towels in the valise. They might as well have been in Sodom and Gomorrah. We and the conductor used our handkerchiefs and the driver his pantaloons and sleeves. By the door inside was fastened a small, old-fashioned looking glass frame with two little fragments of the original mirror lodged down in one corner of it. This arrangement afforded a pleasant double-barreled portrait of you when you looked into it, with one half of your head set up a couple of inches above the other half. From the glass frame hung the half of a comb by a string, but if I had to describe that patriarch or die, I believe I would order some sample coffins. 
It had come down from Isio and Samson, and had been accumulating hair ever since, along with certain impurities. In one corner of the room stood three or four rifles and muskets, together with horns and pouches of ammunition. The station men wore pantaloons, of course, country-woven stuff, and into the seat and in the inside of the legs were sewed ample additions of buckskin to do duty in place of leggings. When the man rode horseback, so the pants were half dull blue and half yellow and unmistakably picturesque. The pants were stuffed into the tops of high boots. The heels were, were armed with great Spanish spurs whose little iron clogs and chains jingled with every step. The man wore a huge beard and mustachios and an old slouch hat, a blue woolen shirt, no suspenders, no vest, no coat, and a leathern sheath on in his belt, a great long navy revolver slung on right side hammer to the front, and projecting from his boot a horn-handled bowie knife. The furniture of the hut was neither gorgeous nor much in the way. The rocking chairs and sofas were not present, and never had been, but they were represented by two three-legged stools, a pine board bench four feet long, and two empty candle boxes. The table was a greasy board on stilts, and the tablecloth and napkins had not come, and they were not looking for them either. A battered tin platter, a knife and fork, and a tin pint cup were at each man's place and the driver had a queensware saucer that had seen better days. Of course, this duke sat at the head of the table. There was one isolated piece of table furniture that bore about it a touching air of grandeur and misfortune. This was a caster. It was German silver and crippled and rusty, but it was so preposterously out of place there that it was suggestive of a tattered exiled king among barbarians and the majesty of its native position compelled respect, even in its degradation. There was only one cruet left, and that was a stopperless, fly-speck, broken-necked thing with two inches of vinegar in it and a dozen preserved flies with their heels up and looking very sorry they had invested there. The station-keeper upended a disc of last week's bread of the shape and size of an old-time cheese, and carved some slabs from it, which were as good as Nicholson pavement and tenderer. He sliced off a piece of bacon for each man, but only the experienced old hands made out to eat it, for it was condemned army bacon, which the United States would not feed to its soldiers in the forts, and the stage company had bought it cheap for the sustenance of their passengers and employees. We may have found this condemned army bacon further out on the plains than the section I'm locating it in, but we found it. There's no gain saying that. Then he poured us a beverage, which was called Slum Gullion, and it's hard to think he was not inspired when he named it. It really pretended to be tea, but there was too much disrag and sand and old bacon rind in it to deceive the intelligent traveler. He had no sugar and no milk, and not even a spoon to stir the ingredients with. We could not eat the bread or the meat nor drink the slum gully in, and when I looked at what that melancholy vinegar cruet, I thought of the anecdote, a very, very old one even at that day, of the traveler who sat down to a table which had nothing on it but a mackerel and a pot of mustard. He asked the landlord if this was all. The landlord said, All? Why, thunder and lightning, I should think there was mackerel enough there for six. But I don't like mackerel. Oh, then, help yourself to the mustard. In other days, I had considered it a good and very good anecdote, but there was a dismal plausibility about it here that took all the humor out of it. Our breakfast was before us, but our teeth were idle. I tasted and smelt and said I would take coffee, I believed. The station boss stopped dead still and glared at me speechless. At last, when he came to, he turned away and said, as one who communes with himself upon matter too vast to grasp, Coffee? Well, if that don't go clean ahead of me, I'm... <laughs> we could not eat, and there was no conversation among the hostlers and the herdsmen. We all sat at the same board. At least there was no conversation further than a single hurry to request now and then from one employee to another. It was always in the same form and always gruffly friendly. Its western Frenchness 
and novelty startled me at first and interested me, but it presently grew monotonous and lost its charm. It was, Pass the bread, you son of a skunk. No, I forget, skunk was not the word, it seems to me. It was still stronger than that. I know it was, in fact, but it has gone from my memory, apparently. However, it does no matter. Probably it was too strong for print anyway. It is the landmark of my memory which tells me where I first encountered the vigorous new vernacular of the Occidental Plains and Mountains. We gave up the breakfast and paid our dollar apiece and went back to our mailbag bed in the coach and found comfort in our pipes. Right here we suffered the first diminution of our princely state. We left our six fine horses and took six mules in their place. But they were wild Mexican fellows, and a man had to stand at the head of each of them and hold him fast while the driver gloved and got himself ready. And when at last he grasped the reins and gave the word, the men sprang suddenly away from the mule's head, and the coach shot from the station as if it had issued from a cannon. How the frantic animals did scamper! It was a fierce and furious gallop, and the gait never altered for a moment till we reeled off ten or twelve miles and swept up the next collection of little station huts and stables. So we flew along all day. At 2 p.m., the belt of timber that fringes the northern plat and its marks its windings through the vast level floor of the plains came in sight. At 4 p.m., we crossed the branch of the river, and at 5 p.m., we crossed the plat itself and landed at Fort Kearney, 56 hours out of St. Joe, 300 miles. Now that was stage coaching on the great overland, 10 or 12 years ago, when perhaps not more than 10 men in America, all told, expected to live to see a railroad follow that route to the Pacific. But the railroad is there now, and it pictures a thousand odd comparisons and contrasts in my mind to read the following sketch in the New York Times of a recent trip over almost the very ground I had been describing. I can scarcely comprehend the new state of things and i quote at four twenty p m sunday we rolled out of the station at omaha and started westward on our long jaunt a couple of hours out dinner was announced an event to those of us who had yet to experience what it is to eat in one of the pullman's hotels on wheels so stepping into the car next forward to our sleeping palace we found ourselves in the dining car it was a revelation to us that first at dinner on Sunday, and though we continued to dine for four days and had as many breakfasts and suppers, our whole party never ceased to admire the perfection of the arrangements and the marvelous results achieved. Upon tables covered with snowy linen and garnished with services of solid silver, Ethiop waiters flitting about in spotless white, placed as by magic a repast at which Delmonico himself could have at no occasion to blush, and indeed, in some respects, it would be hard for that distinguished chef to match our menu, for in addition to all that ordinarily makes up a first chop dinner, we had not our antelope steak, the gourmet who has not experienced this, blah, what does he know of the feast of fat things, our delicious mountain brook trout, choice of fruits and berries, and sauce piquant and unpurchasable, our sweet-scented appetite-compelling air of the prairies. You may depend upon it. We did all justice to the good things, and as we washed them down with bumpers of sparkling Krug, whilst we sped along at the rate of 30 miles an hour, agreed it was the fastest living we had ever experienced. We beat that, however, two days afterwards, when we made 27 miles in 27 minutes, while our champagne glasses filled to the brim spilled not a drop. After dinner, we repaired to the drawing-room car, and as it was Sabbath Eve, we intoned some of the grand old hymns, Praise God for Whom, etc., Shining Shore, Coronation, etc., the voices of the men singers and of the women singers blending sweetly in the evening air, while our train, with its great glaring polyphemous eye, lighting up long vistas of prairie, rushed into the night and the wild then to bed in luxurious coaches where we slept the sleep of the just and only awoke the next morning, Monday, at eight o'clock to find ourselves at the crossing of the North Platte, 300 miles from Omaha, 15 hours and 40 minutes out.